participation in the study uh, after the, the combination, and that is at, um, at a specified time point of 12 cycles of therapy, patients are assessed for MRD detectability, so patients who are MRD undetectable would be randomized to continue uh, with placebo alone, uh, or ibrutinib as a single agent. For those uh, who had detectable MRD, there's a one-to-one -one randomization to ibrutinib as a single agent, or the combination of ibrutinib and venetoclax continue. So here is the study schema um, in a, a slightly different format. Again, uh, th uh, three cycles of ibrutinib as a run-in. Um, combination of ibrutinib and venetoclax. Uh, first assessment of disease was done here after six cycles of the combination, and then serial MRD assessments in the peripheral blood as well as the bone marrow. Um, so some of the efficacy data I have for you uh, really represent the first um, 14 patients who made it all the way to here, as well as 30 patients who made it to this point. And then we have safety data to review as well. Um, so these are the characteristics of the patient enrolled in the trial. Uh, again, these are the 30 patients who have Mature, whose data has matured beyond six cycles of the combination. This is the, the data for all of the patients in this study. And what you can see here is that overall, most of the patients were able to stay on both drugs. So importantly, patients were able to continue, all the patients in the MRD assessment arm have been able to continue with both drugs with only a small number of patients in, in the entire population of treated patients discontinuing either drug. Uh, one was discontinued, um, one patient discontinued for transformation, but the majority of discontinuations are actually for adverse events. Um, and here is just some data again, I think these are the same slides, I'm sorry. Um, so what happens with the three uh, cycles of ibrutinib? So remember that patients uh, with venetoclax, you want to think about the burden of disease that patients have because of the risk of tumor lysis. So the idea in the study schema was try to shift the decrease the patient's risk of having tumor lysis when they came to the time point that they would receive the venetoclax in combination with ibrutinib. And what you can see here is overall, um, when you look at the entire cohort of patients, about 24% of the patients had high risk, were predicted to have high risk for tumor lysis at the outset of the trial. And after three months of ibrutinib alone, that number had changed to 3%. Similarly so, um, what you see is that there tended to be a shift of the entire cohort towards low risk. So overall, giving three months of ibrutinib prior to giving the combination does decrease um, the risk of tumor lysis uh, in, the, in the cohort here, with about 90% of the, the high risk patients shifted to medium to low risk, and about 19% with medium risk shifted to low risk here. As well as you might expect, you can see, uh, the, uh, as you might expect to correlate with this, there's a shift in lymph node bulk as well after three months on ibrutinib. Um, so these are the uh, adverse events for all of the patients treated in the trial, and uh, overall I'd say there's not really anything here that's surprising. Um, the single agent ibrutinib, these are the kinds of toxicities we know well, diarrhea, arthralgias, uh, fatigue. Um, when you look at the combination, overall I think the most important one to point out is there is some increase in neutropenia that probably driven partly by the, uh, most by the nevoclax, um, but overall the rate of grade three and four toxicities is low. Atrial fibrillation overall was relatively low in the patients during the ibrutinib monotherapy uh, phase, as well as relatively low in the combination, and the risk of infections was low in both. Um, so here, I want to just take a quick look at um, the uh, MRD data uh, that was uh, demonstrated. So this is what um, I talked about earlier. 30 patients were evaluable for a, a MRD assessment after six months of the combination, and what you can see here is quite impressively 77% of the patients were MRD undetectable. So this is by eight color flow. Um, and if you see the 14 patients that have already gone through the entire uh, uh, nine cycles of the combination, um, you can see again the response is deepened with time. Uh, the, res the MRD response in the peripheral blood correlates with the response in the bone marrow. Um, and overall, when you look at the, the patients who were valuable for uh, 12 cycles of total treatment, what you can see is about a third of these patients are in complete responses, but the overall response is 100%. So these are, I think, very exciting data, and we look forward to continuing to see these data mature. This is a swimmer's plot to look and show uh, the responses over time. Um, and so in summary for frontline data, I would say that you know, prognostic data is very important. So knowing the mutation status of the patient 
uh, from the perspective of IGHV is very important, as well as understanding um, their fish abnormalities. The goals of first-line therapy really need to reflect the depth of response versus toxicity. Um, also a conversation about fixed duration treatment versus continuous therapy. And I think for select younger patients who are uh, IGHV, this should say mutated, uh, not unmutated, uh, mutated patients, um, FCR could be considered uh, possibly curative. Um, so I'll, I'll try to quickly get through some of the relapse refractory data. What I'll mostly highlight here for you here is that increasingly targeted therapies are being used. Um, ibrutinib, if not used in the front line, has uh, now uh, significant uh, mature data behind it. I won't review that in detail, uh, but I do want to talk to you about the results of the Murano study that were presented at PASH. Um, importantly, I'll also say that there does appear to be a decreasing role for repeat chemotherapy. So for patients who have had chemoimmunotherapy as a frontline treatment, um, you know, with rare exception in patients who have had long remissions to chemoimmunotherapy, most patients seem to have a significant benefit, and most trials demonstrate a benefit by kinase inhibitors. And the other point that's important here is that patients who have been treated in the front line with kinase inhibitors actually tend to do worse with chemoimmunotherapy as a second treatment compared to other kinase inhibitors, and that data I'll show you briefly as well. So I'm gonna skip the ibrutinib data for um, a moment and just show you the, the results of the Murano trial. This is a, a phase three trial of venetoclax versus, uh, plus rituximab versus BR and relapse refractory CLL. Overall, this wasn't a particularly heavily pretreated population, so about two thirds had had only one line, but there were patients who had had more advanced line, and what you'll see is most of the patients have been treated previously with chemotherapy. So this is a predominantly chemotherapy uh, relapse population. What I'll show you here is the uh, modified uh, progression-free survival is the endpoint of the study, and you can see here the green line for venetoclax and rituximab is superior to the DR. Um, and the, the way that this was given in the trial, the combination of then and rituximab was given for six months, and then the patients could continue to then up until 24 months. Um, here, what we're looking at is, again, primarily the investigator uh, reported and the IRC assessed overall response rate, so very high overall response rates for the combination, as well as a slight increase in the CR rates. Now, the difference in the CR rates by investigator and IRC really is driven by the persistence of small lymph nodes. So these are lymph nodes that are detectable on CT between one and a half to three centimeters. That's what sort of downgraded the investigator response by IRC. And overall, when you look at the safety data, um, you know, it, the, the safety data for Ven plus rituximab largely uh, parallel what, what is known for single agent venetoclax with the exception that there does appear to be an increased signal for neutropenia, but overall the combination is very well tolerated. So just as a last point, um, I do want to show these data. These are again data collected by Anthony Beto and a number of centers who are looking at real world use of kinase inhibitors. So these are again patients not treated on trial. And what we're looking at here is really um, in the frontline setting, if we compare the kinase inhibitors that are, that are available for treatment, um, ibrutinib, patients treated with ibrutinib in this data set, which is about 80 patients, tended to have a better response than patients treated with idelalisib in the frontline setting. In the relapse refractory setting, we see the same thing again with PFS. With ibrutinib, it appears to be superior to idelalisib as a, as a relapse refractory treatment. And that benefit seems to hold regardless of the presence or absence of deletion 17P. So again, as a kinase inhibitor, in real world data, um, ibrutinib appears to provide superior PFS over idelalisib. What about patients who have had frontline ibrutinib? What do we know about how they do with subsequent treatment in the real world? So again, these are all patients that are treated with a kinase inhibitor. Most of these patients were treated with ibrutinib frontline. And what we're looking at here are the PFS curves so if, you, if the patient was treated with venetoclax as a second therapy, that's the red line here. Um, another kinase inhibitor that could include ibrutinib or idelalisib, whichever was not used in the front line. And the last curve here is the chemoimmunotherapy curve. So I really want to point out here that patients who have had frontline kinase inhibitors don't do very well with chemoimmunotherapy as a second treatment, and this is an important finding here. All right. Um, and so in summary, I think most of our patients today in the relapse refractory setting tend to receive targeted therapies and the data is very strong for these and these combinations include ibrutinib as a single agent, venetoclax plus rituximab based on the Murano results. I didn't talk so much about idelalisib and rituximab, 
Often the PFS for patients is shorter for that combination than the other two, but it can be a useful bridge to another therapy, so you can get some short-term responses. The long-term toxicities are more challenging with the ideal licit. And overall, patients tend to have poor responses to chemoimmunotherapy in the relapse refractory setting if they previously had a targeted agent. So again, I think this is a population of patients where we really want to be thoughtful about clinical trials, especially appreciating some of these factors.